May 5th, Game 3, Return of the Clippers. It's Clipper Blog Live. Andrew Hahn here with our guests, DJ Foster, Jordan Heimer, and Nick Flint. Nick, we're going to start with you. What did you think about Game 3? Uh, I thought it was pretty ridiculous. Shades of game one, maybe a game one light. Um, I was really disappointed to see the uh, the turnover issues continue. I think that's going to be a key. Uh, you know, up to one now. That's a a, a good position to be in. Still have home court uh, despite the narrow narrow margin of victory in these past uh, whatever three games. And that's all I've got. <laughs> My impressions were Reggie Evans. Oh my goodness, Reggie Evans. I thought he changed the game completely, um, just the way that he was boxing out and kept Memphis off the offensive glass, which was really the big thing about game two, all their offensive rebounds. Um, I thought the way he denied Zach Randolph in the post was brilliant, and those offensive rebounds down the stretch, just gaining extra possessions. Yeah, he can't shoot free throws, but he was huge. I thought he completely changed the game. That's, that's my initial take. You know, I, I thought, I, I tweeted that DJ's formula for success in this game was a perfect Chris Paul and a hyper-aggressive Blake Griffin, and I was amazed that the Clippers were able to win just getting one of those things. Yeah. Uh, but Chris Paul was unbelievable. The sequence in the fourth quarter uh, when the game was tied at 80, and first he hit his trademark, you know, fallaway jumper, and then that beautiful pass to Blake for, I think, Blake's only points after a couple minutes into the third quarter. Um it was amazing they were able to pull out a game in which so many things were still going wrong, starting with Blake Griffin not really being able to find uh, any semblance of an offensive rhythm. Yeah, it really felt like the Clippers stole this game because of all of those missed free throws and botched inbounding plays at the end of the game. Do you think we would have felt a little bit differently if they just kind of cruised when they were up 5, 6, and then closed it out with 7 points, DJ? Um, I mean, probably. Uh, that Rudy Gay shot almost fell. I mean, it was it was right on the front rim, and just he had some tough shots, though, those two threes. There's nothing, I mean, there's nothing really you can do about that. Maybe Blake can step out a little closer, but, yeah, they, they made it interesting. And look, in this series, it's so close that no team is ever out of it, and I think no lead is really safe. Even when you have one of the best closers in the game, Chris Paul on the floor, no lead is safe for either side. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's rewind this game all the way back to the second quarter when the Clippers were up 13. Uh, Nick, what happened? How did, how did the Clippers just give all that up and then go down by seven, I think, in the third quarter? Uh, well, mostly it was the lack of Chris Paul. There was, you know, Memphis was not great on, uh, in the half court by any means, uh, but we are talking third quarter here. We're talking. Yes. We're talking how how they gave up that that second quarter lead. How how, how did they Late build it up? Okay. Just, right. right, right, right. Uh, basically, when Chris Paul went out, you had Eric Bledsoe running the point uh, with I guess Mo Williams was in there, uh, and at different points in the half court, the Clippers weren't looking great. Uh, there were turnover issues. The Grizzlies got runouts, and basically that was it. A lot of the troubles for the Clippers come from, uh, you know, a lack of Chris Paul. Basically, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I don't think I'm you know, oversimplifying. <laughs> no, I, I mean, just to follow up on that, and I'm sure many people in Clipper Nation were with me on this, like, I've never played in the NBA. I don't know what the grind what? of the NBA game is on, on Chris Paul's body, but the choice to kind of get Chris Paul his usual rest at certain points is is confusing in the sense that every moment Chris Paul's off the court, it feels like the Clippers have no chance to compete with this team. And, you know, that stretch in the fourth where Vinny took Chris Paul out from almost 10 minutes left to just more than six minutes left, man, four minutes of rest with the game uh, on the line, that was why this felt like a miracle to me, that, that they could take Chris Paul for those four minutes, let the Grizzlies bring it back to seven points and still steal the game. Uh, I found that so weird to keep him on the bench that long. Yeah, I joked when Chris Paul went out of the game that someone uh, should have broke a water main so he would be able to rest <laughs> while they fixed that. I mean, right, pull a fire alarm or something. Do something. Yeah, it's without him the game just feels there's so much less control. The offense feels like it's just kind of 
And you're just throwing stuff at the wall with Mo Williams and Eric Bledsoe and hoping it sticks. And it worked a little bit for a, for a little stretch um, when Blake was out with the bench guys. I think it was Chris Paul and four bench members. But as soon as Chris Paul came out, <laughs> the Grizzlies came roaring back. So, yeah, when he's not in, it's just trouble. Nick, uh, Griffin's Beard wants to know, is it him or do the Clips just don't get any calls? It is him. Mostly, <laughs> but every, uh, the, I mean, it definitely seems more like it with the, the series being as physical as it has been because, you know, uh, again and again, we've talked about Blake getting, uh, you know, two hands in the back on catches, guys on the inside, we're seeing shoves all over the place on the perimeter holding, but then also uh, there's a region that Reggie Evans was able to play 15 minutes and have his first foul called only at the end of that 15 minutes, so, you know, it's, it's going both ways. Let's talk about Reggie for a second here. Jordan, uh, what did you think about having Reggie in the game, basically that second half instead of DeAndre? We've talked about this, you know, in the Clipper blog live after both playoff games. It's quite clear that Vinny does not trust DeAndre in these big spots. And when you watch him on the court, you see moments uh, every game. And again, this was no difference. Uh, DeAndre will foul a shooter with two or three seconds left in the shot clock. He'll go for a ball fake. He'll be off his feet at times where there's no reason to be jumping at all. And I think Vinny has just shown that he trusts Kmart and Reggie in these big spots to just be in the right places and understand the situation and the moment a little more. Um, and, you know, I would be surprised to see DeAndre get any stretch minutes really the rest of the way in this series. Hmm. I thought that uh, DJ was pretty effective in that first half, but Man, Marcus Gasol really just put it to him in that third quarter. Uh, DJ, do you think there was any uh, adjustments that the Grizzlies made to get Gasol more involved in the second half? Um, I thought it was interesting. They were posting him a lot more, I noticed, giving him more low post touches than they were in the previous two games. They were just trying to run him out of the high post exclusively. So I think that was their big change. Um, but as far as, I mean, as far as Reggie goes, when he's on, like he was tonight, and playing, like, every possession with just the utmost, like, energy and, and just really just playing every, every single possession like that, I think you can go with Reggie. And, yeah, it looks a little weird to have, you know, your $10 million man on the bench the entire second half, but as long as Reggie is hot like he was tonight, you can stick with him. If he's doing what he did in game two, I think you got to go back to DeAndre. Uh, Nick Apostolos tweets in, CP3, Bledsoe, Young, Blake, and Reggie have to play together more. How do you feel about that, that lineup? That sounds very weird. Could, could, could you type that out so I can look at that? You, first off, there is a Blake and Reggie front line, which in this series could work. In any other series, it would be uh, probably five fouls on either side like this. <sighs> I kind of like that, actually. Yeah, I don't mind that with how effective Reggie's been. We saw some uh, Reggie DeAndre action today. That was basically, it was either Kenyon or uh, DeAndre out on the floor at either point. So we're getting closer to the kind of uh, the kind of offense-defense mix, and we're getting closer, I think, to seeing more CP3 blood, so, which we saw some in the fourth quarter tonight. I was going to say, that actually was the crunch time lineup, except with Randy Foy and for Nick Instead Young. Of, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, game three. It's, it's worth noting that something Clipper fans have been demanding all year or doubting Vinny's capability to do all year is, can he go with the hot hands? Can he take a lineup and say, this is our basic lineup, but we're going to adjust uh, based on situations that have shown themselves for that game and that night? Um, and I thought he did a really nice job with that today, actually, having Randy Foy in late who, even on the very final possession, uh, his contest of that Rudy Gay shot made him pump fake a little bit. Maybe that was the difference in missing that shot. Yep. Randy Foy quietly with a good game. Uh, DJ, I know you were concerned about Rudy Gay for this entire series. You just didn't really know how the Clippers were going to match up with him. Yeah. yeah. Aside from those two final uh, crazy three-point clutch shots, he was uh, one for, let's see here, he was one for nine, and then he had two blown coverage shots. So that brings him up to three for 11 before those two three-pointers. But he was 12 for 15 from the line. Yeah. Do you think uh, that, aside from the free-throw shooting aside, uh, is that something that the Clippers are going to be able to reproduce, just their, 
I guess their their quote unquote stout defense of Rudy Gay. Yeah, I, I mean, he still got to the line a ton, like you said, so it's hard to say that they did a perfect job in defending him. But, yeah, I think they have to keep playing physical like that with him and just contest every shot and really not give him any space because when he's wide open, he's usually a pretty good shooter. So, yeah, I would say they have to keep keep being as physical as they were tonight. I think you live with him beating you on the line as opposed to giving him open shots. Yeah, and this was... Even in the regular season, we saw him. Uh, the team managed to force him into some turnovers, especially you know he hasn't uh, he hasn't been great in isolation this year. No different. He had I think what five, four or five turnovers tonight. Uh, but also you know he drew fouls. Um, Karan Butler obviously made his return tonight. Uh, he's done a, a pretty solid job on uh, on uh, who, who are we talking about here again? <laughs> What is it, Rudy Gay? Yeah. That fella. Trust me, trust me. Just just lost it for a second there. Um, for, anyway, he he does a pretty solid job. Nick Young committed a couple of fouls on uh, hook shots, jump shots, but we've seen those uh, from pretty much anybody on him in the past. I was pretty pleased with uh, Randy Foy, though. I was very surprised with him as Karan only played 17 minutes or so tonight. Randy got the call with uh, 35. Very surprised about that. Uh, a lot of damage from Rudy in transition, which you can't really help when you have 18 turnovers also. Let's talk about Karan here for a second, because he did come back after breaking his fifth metacarpal in his offhand. Do you, Jordan, do you think that Karan's insistence to come back, I think DJ tweeted that Karan may be the, the first Clipper to come back before his his uh, quoted timetable from injury. Do you first think, time ever. Yeah. Do you think... Uh, <laughs> Kron coming back injected some uh, some of, some of that tough juice uh, identity into the Clippers because if they if they played the way they did in Game One and Two, I'm not sure that they win this one. You know, I, I do think so, Andrew. And you know, sometimes I know all of us are very skeptical of uh, intangibles, but this was a team that was pretty much did, didn't everyone use the verb manhandle punk at least once over the last two or three days you got to assume that these guys knew that, they heard that, that the story emerging was they're not tough enough to play this Memphis team. And so I think to get Karan back in just kind of this classic, you know, Willis Reed style move of I'm going to, you know, break, you know, you're out for a month, though I'm out for three days, and here I am, I'm back. And like that famous Willis Reed game, Willis Reed wasn't all that effective. You know, there was the big uh, emotional push of him running out there, and then he played about 20 minutes in that game, a lot like uh, Karan Butler here. I'm not trying to compare the situations, um, but I do think that boost of seeing an injured uh, colleague return played into an entirely tougher mindset that the Clips took uh, into the first half tonight, today. Yeah. I think it's impressive that he played the entire game with a, a squishy ball tied to his hand, basically. They said it's like a gel packet brace around <laughs> around his left hand. And he said he was in a bunch of pain, I heard, on the, the sideline interview. So, yeah, I think I think just that is, like Jordan said, an emotional lift, even if maybe he didn't do too much on the floor. Uh, yeah, and by the way, I would just add, not only did he not do too much on the floor, he couldn't dribble. There were a few <laughs> times where he tried to make a little bit of a move or a cut in the open court. He's really having trouble dribbling, and I don't know how effective he's going to be the rest of the way offensively. Would you, Jordan, would you stick with Kron if he wants to play game four? Do you start him again like today and just see whatever he can give you, or do you uh, put him back down on the bench and let him uh, sit with Chauncey? You absolutely do. Even if all he can give you is that first ten-minute push against Rudy Gay, where he goes out there and, like he did tonight, just basically plays the best ten minutes of defense that anyone's going to play on Gay all night, I think that alone is is a net positive over what Bobby Simmons is going to give you. Yeah, and it gives him different looks just having another guy. It's When you're playing, it's difficult to, you don't know how a certain guy is going to defend you and everybody has their things that they want to do defensively. So just throwing in another guy on Rudy Gay it mixes up the coverages a little bit, I guess. And it helps the offense, too, because you want to have, you know, you don't want guys having to dig down if Rudy is going to be posting up in isolation, like Nick Young and uh, Randy Foy, especially Randy Foy. You know, you want to have pretty fresh legs in terms of jump shooting. So. Nick, uh, the Clippers lost the free throw attempts battle, well, free throws made and attempts, and the rebounding battle again today, and the offensive rebounding battle again. What 
what can they do to fix any of this? I mean, it's it's not as bad as game game two was, but still. well, I don't I, well, I don't think they actually did lose the offensive rebounding battle, especially by percentage, and especially if you could uh, actually track the uh, the rebounds that were knocked out of bounds. It definitely it, it favored the Clippers. That's team rebounding. I, someone Google that, you'll figure it out. Uh, I'm not going to explain it, but uh, in terms of the uh, the free throws, uh, that was brutal, especially allowing the Grizzlies to get runouts. Uh, did a much better job of containing Mike Conley. But, uh, you know, Rudy Gay is going to draw some fouls uh, just, you know, because that's a, a favorable matchup for them. And then on the Clippers' end, uh, you know, if you're going to have Reg, uh, Reggie Evans on the floor a lot, he's going to get fouled. He's going to have to make half of them. He isn't always going to do it. Blake Griffin, same way. Uh, what more can you say, you know? DJ, yeah. that... Go ahead, Jordan. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just following up on what Nick said. By you know, you asked what can they do to fix this, and how are they going to change going to the next game? And it's something Arnovitz has said all se season, which is the Clippers don't have a systematic path to victory. They can't just say, especially if you acknowledge that Blake is not going to be effective in the half court offense against this team. There's no system. There's no we'll work you know into Dwight Howard and out to shooters. We're going to work the big three in Miami or San Antonio. It's it's basically Chris Paul and trying to get the most out of the chaos of those perimeter shooters that you can. Um, and so I think just to a great extent, that's why every Clipper victory feels a little bit like it was stolen because there's just no sense of, well, they could go out there and play their game and win because their game involves hoping that Randy Foy hits, you know, four out of five from three or Mo Williams or whoever it is. There's always going to be that random variable in any Clipper victory. Yeah, well, I think their game, too, is... But do we getting... really have to watch... Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I just, I just want to know. I, I, the, the Grizzlies, I think, shot 38 free throws the last game, 39 this game. Are, are, we really, are, are the Clippers really going to be giving up almost 40 free throw attempts a game? DJ? Are they going to be giving up that many free throw attempts? I mean, I don't know. I guess my point, though, is that for the Clippers have won games with possession by getting more possessions than their opponents throughout the year. They don't turn over the ball. You know, they usually are pretty good on the glass. And the Grizzlies don't really allow you to do that. And so I think it takes away any – that was kind of their system, was that they hold on to the ball and get more possessions than their opponent, and the Grizzlies take that away. So what we're seeing, like Jordan said, is just Chris Paul and Prey, basically. And that – That'll work sometimes. I still don't. I feel like the Grizzlies are, are played better, really, than the Clippers. But Chris Paul was, you know, the the star and really kind of kind of carried it. Interjection, interjection. Uh, um, we we can and give the Clippers some credit. I mean, I, somebody just tweeted: Grizzlies went seven minutes without a field goal in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, the Grizzlies are a team with flaws too. The Clippers exploit them, uh, especially in terms of when they can actually not turn, cough the ball up, give up runouts. Uh, you know, the Clippers have some uh, defensive success, so that's nice. We can we can enjoy that. Yeah, Nick, uh, talking about the Grizzlies for a second and, and their fourth quarter problems. Uh, five for seventeen in game one. 3 for 15 tonight in game 3. Do you think uh, that that's just going to be a recurring problem for the Grizzlies and that's that's basically what the Clippers are going to have to rely on, that they can go cold for long stretches? Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure if I would totally put it on going cold. You know, uh, in part, I would, you know, going back to Blake Griffin, not a great game tonight. If he makes those free throws, we're looking at like a, what, a 20-5 and five or something like that. But, uh, you know, drew some fouls on Marc Gasol. If they can, if, if I think if they can keep Marc Gasol out of the game uh, in general, then you're going to see the Grizzlies struggle offensively because Mike Conley uh, has not shown that he can be that consistent. Uh, O.J. Mayo, these guys out on the perimeter, and especially not if there's not an inside-out kind of situation going. I have a question for you guys about Blake, which is in the first half, it seemed like he was being more aggressive. And you saw, I remember that play in the first quarter where he had Gasol face up to the basket, he beat him, he got the foul, and you saw Chris Paul saying, do that every time, hitting him in the chest, saying, let's go. And he had 15 points at the half, finished with 17 or 19, what were the adjustments? I mean, what happened to him as the game progressed that, that he kind of didn't have those shots as, as things went on? 
Um, I guess I'll go first. This is a good question. I equated it to the Grizzlies' front line as being a wall. And to break through a wall, you need separation. And so I thought in the first half, Blake was doing a great job of creating space for himself and then attacking with a head full of steam. When he just has his back to the basket in a basic post-up situation, he can't create that space, and he's not tall enough to get the shot over Gasol or anything like that. He can't move those guys. So he needs to be running with momentum. Um, so I guess the adjustment really for the Grizzlies was to stay out with him more and, you know, don't don't allow him that space to wind up and go. Uh, at least that's what I saw. As far as basic dump-ins to the post, I don't think that's really the way to go with Blake. I, wanna, I want him facing up and going off the dribble and attacking quick, 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 quick. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested to go back and see how much Maurice Spates, he, he ended up playing 18 minutes tonight. Uh, I don't know how many of those came in the second half. Uh, I feel like we definitely saw Blake get catches uh, like on that blow by. One of them was against Gasol where he got some space baseline. And I felt like after that we saw more catches in the middle, even in the pick and roll. Uh, we saw him get cut off baseline more. They kind of made some adjustments in terms of getting him back into the help and in the middle, which we've seen, you know, three or four guys in the paint, and two of those guys are walling off, as you said. Uh, and, you know, he's just going to have to make shots over the top of that and he, because he's getting good position even when, you know, Zach Randolph or Gasol, either one, uh, he just can't quite get one of those weird hybrid hooks to fall. And then he also, as we said, he missed some, uh, some free throws where he still drew fouls despite the effective defense. If Blake Griffin would set a screen like Reggie Evans sets a screen, he'd get himself 8 to 10 more points a game. And I think that's crazy over a regular season, obviously. He's not going to get that just by setting better screens. But I feel like tonight against the Grizzlies, they're so vulnerable. If, if you just set a good screen, you get so much more space to work with, and then Paul can deliver you a good pass. I don't know. He needs, he needs to work as a screener. Talk, talking yeah, about these definitely. screens for a second, DJ, uh, I think in Game 3... We saw the Clippers run a double screen for Chris Paul where I think uh, DJ came out first, screened, and Tony Allen uh, slipped, went across that screen, and then Kmart came again and gave a second screen, and that caught Tony Allen, but Kmart got called for a moving screen. How come we don't see these double screens more often? Oh, that's a good question. I guess because someone has to have the threat of a pop in a double screen, right? Because if you're coming off two of them, one guy's rolling, one guy has to pop because both guys can't roll because it's crowded. So I think someone has to have the threat of that jumper, and Kenyon doesn't have it. And Blake is so slow with his, you know, it's like a catapult winding up uh, that I don't think defenses necessarily have to respect it as much. So I guess that's my simple it's answer. Really, yeah. it's, really curious to see. It's, it's, it's really curious to see what's happening to Blake in this series because he had such a good run-up at the end of the regular season, just really taking it to Atlanta and then New York, it just seems like he all that confidence and momentum he built up just disappeared. I don't, I don't know what to make of any of it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't read too much into his confidence and momentum. I, I think that's still there, and I don't want to exaggerate uh, how badly he's playing. He's not the second best player in the series. He's still the fourth or fifth best player in the series. I guess the question is, will that be enough? I, I just think to compare it to the last couple of games of the regular season against the Hawks and, you know, a, a Knicks team that at times looks like they were trying to punt the game, um, he just hasn't had that kind of space to work with. Yeah, I think you got to give the Grizzlies' defense a lot of credit for the way that they've played him. Um, but ultimately, I think he he has the talent to be better than the fourth or fifth guy in this series, the way the way that he's played. He just has to start doing the little things because Memphis kind of forces you to focus on those little things. And I thought that backdoor cut that he had, f you know, from Paul, that was one of his only buckets in the second half and a huge one to make it a two-possession game, was a perfect example of the little things that he can do to get buckets. One-on-one, -on -one, it's just not going to happen. But if he moves off the ball and, you know, sets good screens, it will. Yeah, definitely. We haven't seen a big change in terms of his aggression one on one. You know, we still we still see him attacking this series. He's still drawing some fouls, so I think that's uh, that's comforting in part that he isn't you know he isn't going back to lean on a fadeaway or anything like that, which we really don't want to see. Right. Uh, so game three is in the books. The Clippers came out of this one victorious. 
Uh, I, I saw a graphic up on the screen that said, when the series is tied 1-1, the winner of Game 3 wins the series 76% of the time. Does it make you feel any more comfortable that the Clippers are going to pull this one out? Make, does the game make you feel less comfortable? Nick, how do you feel? I'm so glad you came to me first so I can give you the full... Obviously, the team that has won blank game in the series is going to go <laughs> on to win most of the games. That's like confirmation bias. The team that wins generally wins. You know what I'm saying? Uh... I'm, I guess I'm comforted by the fact that the Clippers didn't get killed on the boards again. We know that they can make some defensive adjustments in the half court. Um, it's still, you know, this is a toss-up of a series. It's very, still very much like that Pacers-Bulls uh, Pacers thing from last season where you've got very close games that could go either way. Uh, you know, maybe the Clippers are going to win two more ridiculously close games and win it in five for all I know, but uh, very close. Oh, game four prediction. Uh, psh, Grizzlies win. By some amount of points, <laughs> three, three points. Yeah, uh, like Nick said, I'm always glad when we get a chance to talk about confirmation bias in the in the live podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the fact that they won today doesn't change the fact that for yet another game, the Grizzlies look like the better all around team. And I think if the Clippers do drop game four, it's it's kind of hard to imagine them going back and stealing another game in Memphis without. Uh, an elevated performance from Blake Griffin from what we've seen so far. Um, I, I think game four is, is again, Blake and is going to be the, the key matchup to watch. Uh, that rising chorus of, you know, all the kind of pundits is only going to rise to a higher pitch by Monday. Blake is now officially having a disappointing series. Um, and I just, uh, I, I look to him breaking out of that in game four. That was incoherent, by the way, the way I just went through those sentences. I barely speak English today. <laughs> Jordan, do you think that uh, that Blake getting that technical foul caused by Zach Randolph and then everyone getting in his space, do you think that threw him off his game a little bit? Because it did seem like he was uh, willing to pound it a little bit more early, and then he kind of went missing from that second to, I guess, basically when Chris Paul found him at the end of the game. Uh, well... Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I would uh, I would question the causality of that premise. Yes, uh, he did seem to disappear from the, from the game a little bit, but you know, DJ's explanation of how kind of that wall and that room works, I see as much more of a reason than that technical. Because even after that tech, there was still the most fiery moment of the game for Blake, which was where he kind of shoved Zach Randolph off off of him um, after a foul down low, and there ended up being a scrum and Chris Paul pulling Blake away. So I didn't see it as him being all of a sudden very tentative. Uh, I just think these are exhausting games for Blake Griffin. He looks tired out there. He's getting hacked. He's getting leaned on. Zach Randall, uh, as much as everyone's talking about him being only at 70%, I'm very impressed with his tenacity and his level of fitness in terms of what he's doing to deny Blake the ball. Yeah, it's it's a battle. This series is so physical. It's hard to get really a grasp on it just because it's just so ugly, right? And it's we're not seeing like certain the strategy is to just beat up your opponent. It's I think Kevin Arnett said it best. It's checkers, not chess. And I don't know, for me, it the Clippers kind of have to fight fire with fire at this point. And they did that with defense in the fourth quarter and really locking down and causing turnovers. Memphis had like 18 turnovers, I think, tonight. So I don't know. For, for me, at least, it's the key to the series is still the possession battle. And I think, I think as long as the Clippers can succeed in that and not get killed the way in game two, um, they're in good shape as long as Chris Paul, again, is perfect or very, very, very close to perfect. Yeah, and just... To sum it up, you know, we've said, uh, I think all of us have said or thought at some point, you know, the Grizzlies have been a slightly better overall team, but these are still two deeply flawed teams, uh, very close in terms of record and success in the regular season. So um, it's, it's, you know, yeah, it's bad, bad checkers, basically. Two very flawed checkers players. Maybe it's connect four. Maybe it's not even checkers. <laughs> oh, I like that. Where'd you get me? Diagonally, with sitting Marcus all in the fourth quarter. Jordan, I think you said uh, you, you like the Grizzlies in Game Four. Uh, I didn't actually. I, okay. I simply said that that if the Grizzlies win Game Four, I looked for them to take the series. I think Game Four is the game of the series at this point. And again, like 
Nick says, that's ridiculously reductive because in any close series, the next game is the game of the series. Um, but I'm going to stick with that statement anyway. Okay. okay. Well, how about a prediction, though? Who do you like in game four? No prediction. No prediction for Jordan Heimer. <laughs> this is not... No. <laughs> I am go I, as taking a stand for Jordan, I am not going to offer a prediction either. No, I, do you use, I appreciate that. You have no idea. I'm going to use these last few seconds of mine to commend Reggie Evans for changing the game and uh, just out-battling the toughest team in the league and probably the toughest front court uh, there is out there. Okay. Well, then I'm just going to close with this one stat that I saw go by on Twitter. Apparently, Chris Paul has a ridiculous 38.7 PER in the fourth quarter. So, uh, I, and Chris Paul we trust, I guess. Wrapping it up. For DJ Foster, Jordan Heimer, Nick Flint, I'm Andrew Hahn. Thanks for tuning in.